please welcome Julie Pichon, and she's making a talk about how to contribute to open source. Thanks a lot. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming here this afternoon. I hope you're here because you think uh, that open source is awesome like I do. Um, the first time I created this presentation about just a few years ago, it, I kept hearing people who are considered to be very bright, uh, and I have a lot of respect for who would tell me, oh, there's no way I could possibly ever contribute to open source. And I had only a couple of first-time contribution in a couple of projects, so not that much. But I still thought, you know, you're wrong, and I hope I can show you uh, that it's not that difficult. And um, uh, just maybe plant the seed of an idea that, yes, you too can contribute to open source. So let's see who we have in the audience at the moment. Who's already contributed to open source before? Maybe a, a patch or... Uh, a translation or a bug report. Okay, cool. So um, uh, maybe you should consider using the Q&A session as well for sharing your own tip for people who would like to become open source contributor for the first time ever. Please feel free to. And uh, in the meantime, I'm going to describe the process for contributing for the first time. Um, it's a short session. It should be around 15 minutes because really contributing to open source is not that hard, and I hope this is what I can show today. So normally I start this talk by giving people a handout. So I thought I would check how big the room was that I was speaking in, and uh, after a few moments of panic that had no relation to printing, um, I decided not to bother this time, so you're getting a PDF. Um, it's at tinyurl.com slash ep open source, and it's a, a summary of what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, it also has a few projects that have a good reputation for being, being friendly to new contributors. Some of them are in Python, some of them are related to Python, some of them are not. Um, and there's also a link to a transcript if you prefer reading to that whole listening thing. Uh, a tiny bit about myself, as I said, um, uh, I have a few patches in a few projects. I was kind of a first -time contrib serial first-time contributor where I would make a contribution to a project and then run away in happiness for a while. Um, and then about 18 months ago, I joined Red Hat and now I get to contribute to open source every day, which is pretty cool. And it also means I've learned a few more things about open source communities that I hope I can share with people who are hoping to, to make their first step as a, an open source contributor. Okay, so who is this talk for? It's for people who love open source and would really, really like to give back, but they're not sure how to do that. They're not sure how to start. They're not sure if they're smart enough or if their skills would be valued. And my goal today, by standing in front of you, is to help you make the jump from a zero to one contribution, or maybe plus one if you raised your, your hand earlier. So let's clarify something very important first. Everyone can contribute. You do not need to be a genius to contribute. I am most definitely not a genius. All kind of skills are valued, um, and all, all, at all levels as well. You don't need to be a super mega hardcore developer. You don't even need to be a developer at all. And you definitely don't need to have 10 years of experience in whatever technology in order to be able to make a meaningful contribution. And um, so I'm going to tell you where you can start. I'm going to, um, first I'm going to tell you about what I like to call a wonderful shortcut. And then we're going to see how the workflow usually um, works like. So who here is familiar with openhatch.org? Oh, that's very few people. I hope if you forget everything I mentioned today, please just remember those guys, because they're absolutely, absolutely wonderful. Uh, Openhatch is um, an organization whose mission statement is actually lowering the barrier to entry um, in open source projects for newcomers. And they do a lot of wonderful work, and they're very friendly people. Uh, the way they do that is that they have 
in-person workshop in the US, they go to universities to teach students how to contribute, and they also have this website where they try to bring together a lot of small bugs, small tasks that are good for newcomers, the help requested, help wanted, also people who are willing to mentor people who are starting out. And uh, they also classify all that stuff by project and by language. So sometimes if you want to start learning a new language and do it uh, in a useful way, uh, you could do worse and go to openhatch.org and uh, pick an open source project that's in the language you're considering learning. Um, okay. So now the way it usually works. Even if uh, you've used openhatch, you might want to find the contributor guidelines for the project you're interested in contributing to. Uh, that should. The reason it's important, not every project has them, but I think for your very first ever contribution, you want to find a project that has contributor guidelines because it means they've thought about it and they care. They care about new contributors coming to help them. And what reading the contributor guidelines will, will give you is that it's going to give you a sense of direction. You probably have an idea of the kind of contribution you'd like to make, but uh, you don't know where to go to, to do that, the contributor guidelines will tell you. It should also give you an idea of what matters to the project, and uh, maybe also some idea of what to watch out for. Maybe there are very strict guidelines for how to format your patch. So read them. Don't try to remember it all. It's just giving you a general idea of what's important to the project. Uh, so here's an example. That's from the OpenStack Contributor Guidelines. I'm going to use it as a Python example through the presentation, but um, it wasn't my very first contribution to open source ever. So they have a lot in the wiki, they, they care. And it's a complicated contributor process, so it's good that they try to, to document it. Otherwise, uh, that's how the process usually looks like for contributing, even if there's no contributor guidelines, most projects kind of follow the same workflow. Uh, so first you read the guideline if they exist, otherwise you just go to the bug tracker to find something to work on, or maybe you already have an idea because you found a problem in a project you like and you would like to help with fixing it. So find something to work on, then you build the software, and uh, then you find the bug, fix it, and submit the batch. It's easy peasy, right? <laughs> So we're going to go through a bit more details for each of these steps. We've done the computer, contributor guidelines bit, so know the bug tracker. Uh, this is a short uh, extract from uh, one of the OpenStack bug trackers, and it's about bugs that, are, uh, that have the low-hanging fruit tag. A lot of projects, especially when they get larger, they start marking bugs that would be good for a new contributor with a special tag. It might be low-hanging fruit, or it might be bite size, or easy picking, or gnome loaf. And you learn that stuff by reading the contributor guidelines, because this is where they will document it. So have a look through this task. For a first bug, for a first contribution to a project, usually having a very small contribution is good, because you have a lot of other things to learn, which we're going to come back to. And um, before you come with your seven new features that refactor have the entire project, you also need to build a bit of trust with the existing community and just pick up the conventions that are not necessarily documented anywhere. So, you know what you want to work on. So if it's a big project, you also know which components you need to build now. Um, so you need to find the instruction for how to build it. Usually it's on the project page or... Um, Maybe it's going to be in the contributor guidelines. If you can't find them, in my opinion, if a bug is marked as a low-hanging fruit or whatever newcomer tag is, there's kind of an implicit mentorship offer in that. Um, uh, that is, if you come back to the bug and ask a question saying, I'd tried A, B, and C, but I can't figure out how to do D to build the software, can you help me? People will expect this kind of question if, if, it's, if it's a bug for newcomers, so don't hesitate to ask. Something else you might find is that um, maybe it's documented, but you don't understand all the steps. So now would be also a good time to go back to Open Hatch because they have this concept of training missions, where they explain some of the tools that 
open source developers maybe forget they had to learn in the first place because it's second nature, no? So just use OpenHatch as a stepping stone, learn, for, learn when you, what you need to, and then you can come back to, um, to building the software. So once you've done this, build the software from source, you can try to reproduce the bugs that uh, you, you picked for yourself and, and fix it. In my case, um, that was my first bug in OpenStack ever. It was a one-liner. <laughs> it wasn't marked as a low-hanging fruit, but it could have been. Um, there's kind of a focus on code in this talk because I'm a software developer and that's what I'm familiar with, but it doesn't mean that other types of contribution are not valued or welcome, on the contrary, so please don't interpret these examples in this way. Um, so that's what a low-hanging fruit might look like in OpenStack as well. You'll see the tag uh, in Launchpad, and you'll also, it might even, they might even tell you which file the, the bug is actually located in, so you don't have to learn the entire architecture of the project just to figure out how to fix maybe a typo or something very simple. So another plus for low-hanging fruit, if you're not using them in your project, maybe consider doing it. And... Um, Hey, it's time to submit your patch. Maybe, you know, don't do it just yet. <laughs> uh, you want to make sure, you know, it's tested and all that, but also you might want to come back to the contributor guidelines because this will tell you uh, what your patch should look like and um, maybe even one co what command you should use to format it. Some projects are very picky about which Git command you use to format your patch. And then the contributor guidelines should tell you where to send it as well. Uh, if they don't tell you where to send it, usually attaching it to, um, to the bug report is uh, a safe bet. Um, yes, yeah, so congratulations, <laughs> you've made your first open source contribution. It wasn't that difficult, right? So take time to congratulate yourself because that's pretty cool. Um, now the real next step, which I didn't mention in, uh, in, in the contributor process, is that you will have to wait. Uh, sometime, quite a bit of time. Uh, and then one of three things might happen. Maybe your patch will be accepted straight away because you picked a very simple contribution, right? There's not much that could go wrong. Uh, maybe you'll get some feedback. And if it makes sense to you, then take it into account and submit a new, uh, a new version of the patch and just interact with the community. And the third response that is probably just as likely is that you will only hear silence. It will sound like your patch is lost in the head air and you're not quite sure what happened. Um, don't be discouraged. And after a couple of weeks, it's usually okay to start pinging people and asking, uh, is this normal? What's happening? Should I do something different? Uh, in my case, I was lucky. It took about four days for my patch to, to be merged. But I really want to come back to the fact, don't let yourself be discouraged if um, you don't get an, an answer instantly. The one rule, I think, of all open source projects ever is that there's never enough people to help. There's never enough time to do everything that needs to be done. And a healthy project knows, they know that they need new people. They are rooting for you to stay because um, a healthy project needs new blood to stay alive. Um, if you do get an answer and it's not very nice, <laughs> don't be discouraged and don't stick around either. It's just not worth it. There's a lot of communities out there that would really like to have your help and your skills. If people are just a bit nasty, there's no point in staying there. But really, most people are nice. My experience in open source has been that most people are nice. And because you'll have read the contributor guidelines and you'll have done all you can, uh, to do things properly, there won't be any dragon. It's, um, it's, uh, it's going to be okay. Oh, yeah, something else I learned later on. When I just started in open source, I thought you weren't supposed to talk to anyone until you had like 17 patches accepted and you had proven yourself as uh, someone who's totally awesome technically, but it turns out that's not true. It actually helps if you try to interact with the community as you're starting to contribute and it's going to make the process a lot easier both for you and for the people who are reviewing your patch if they know you and they, they know you can take feedback without becoming upset. Um, 
And it's just a lot nicer for everyone. Basically, I had forgotten about the fact that it's open source communities, it's not just open source. So, um, yeah, try to involve yourself uh, with the community as well. Uh, maybe idle on IRC and chat with people, read the mailing list, and if there's a meetup close to where you are, um, uh, talk to people. Okay, so I spoke too fast again. <laughs> if you forgot everything, reminder, openhatch.org, awesome people, very friendly. If you have any question, you can send them email. They're, they're a really great bunch who are entirely dedicated to helping newcomers find their way. And uh, is there any questions already? Or any tips to share for people who already have a lot or some experience contributing to open source from can you come to the microphone, maybe? Thank you. Hi, thanks for your talk. You're welcome. Um, this might be a bit of an advanced topic, but uh, do you have tips for people who ask you, uh, where can I learn about how to collaborate on GitHub? Because um. I find Git utterly confusing, and I'm a long standing developer. Uh, so do you just mean how to learn how to use Git itself? Or? Yeah, because, for example, nobody tells you that in most uh, projects, after you clone the mm. repository, you should branch. <laughs> I had to find that out on my own. Yeah, I would hope people would describe that kind of information in the contributor guidelines. Mm. I don't know to what level of details and information the Open Hatch folks go into in the training mission, but mm. I think they have stuff about that and the, uh, the way it usually works in open source. And I agree it would be useful because people usually just tell you, oh, if you don't know Git, here's a good tutorial, but that doesn't necessarily mm. tell you about the culture that the project is mm. using. So if you contributed to a project that expected this and they didn't do it, I would say help them improve their documentation by adding it to it or filing a bug about this because that would be helpful, I agree. Yeah, I have to admit it was kind of a rhetoric question. So uh, <laughs> um, if you have contributing guidelines, not only describe, well, we use GitHub, but set, uh, print, put in the actual commands you yeah. have to uh, use to make your first uh, yeah. pull request. Yeah, a lot of people learn about your project, but also about Git at the same time, so that's, that's a lot to take in. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, thank <laughs> yeah, it's a bit lower. <laughs> uh, thanks for the talk. And uh, from my uh, first-hand experience, I would say a very good way to get started is also to attend the sprint and just to talk That's to true. people uh, which are sitting next to you. It's the easiest and the fastest way to get started. So everybody's invited to sprints after the conference if you're staying here for the weekend. Yeah, I second that recommendation. Usually you have core contributors of the project you're interested in at attending the sprints as well, and it's very cool to get Django advice from someone who's been working on it for years and years and things like that. So yes, come to the sprints. It's gonna be it's gonna be cool. Okay, if questions come to your mind later, feel free to find me and I'll try to answer as best as I can. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>